uh, panel six. The panel participants are Mr. Bruce Eddy from the Western District of Arkansas, um, Ms. Elizabeth Ford, director of the CDO in the Eastern District of Tennessee. <laughs> Thank you. I know you're trying to confuse me here. <laughs> um, let me make sure. Ms. Christine Freeman, director of the CDO in the Middle District of Alabama. Mr. Henry Martin, Middle District of Tennessee. Ms. Marjorie Myers, from the uh, Federal Public Defender from the Southern District of Texas. And Ms. Dor Doris Randall Holt, uh, Federal Public Defender from the Western District of Tennessee. Um, and our committee. Um, Members for this panel are uh, Judge Dale Fisher, uh, Catherine Rowe, Dr. Robert Rucker, and Judge Reggie Walton. And so we'll begin with a brief, very brief opening statement. Um, as I've said before, we have received your written submissions, so you don't really need to read from those or anything. We just would like a you know, sort of short introduction. Um, and then after that, we'll be asking questions from the uh, committee. So Ms. Ford, we'll start with you. OK. Um, good morning. Um, I think this is a very exciting opportunity that everyone in this room has that we're going to be able to contribute to what I hope are changes in the Criminal Justice Act that will benefit our clients and that will benefit the, the Sixth Amendment. Um, I think that there are many areas where the system probably needs to be just completely thrown out and we start over. There are areas that need to be overhauled uh, to some extent, and then there are areas where things are going fairly well, but I think that you can always improve. Uh, I grew up in a very small county in the mountains of East Tennessee where it was not geekish to be a member of the 4-H club, and the 4-H club's motto was to make the best better. So I think that there are certainly um, some parts of the, the way the Criminal Justice uh, Act is currently working that are good that we can, we can make better. Um, I took one, one thing that I have found to be extremely exciting about this opportunity was to learn and to learn more about how the system works. And uh, I took the, uh, the list, the scope of the committee's work and I prepared a report card. So this was a, a great review for me to, to go through the, the list of things on the, the scope of study and to, to give, a, give a grade and then to try to justify the grade. So I, I look forward to the rest of our conversation today. Uh, there have been several, there were several things mentioned this morning that I, uh, some unanswered questions that that you all particularly had of Judge Shirley that uh, later on I hope that I can uh, answer for the group. Ms. Freeman. Thank you. Um, I gave you very lengthy testimony in my written remarks. I don't want to expand on that other than I'm looking forward to having questions and discussion. I'm, I viewed this as an opportunity in, in writing my statement to reflect on our work and um, that is I hope those reflections are of some help to you, but I also hope very much that we can have a discussion about capital habeas today. Thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. What I've come to know and to see is that the federal judges have been tasked with responsibilities to manage the indigent criminal defense system. We have the circuit court judges who appoint and reappoint the federal public defenders. They also set the number of attorneys that a federal public defender office may have. Our budgets, federal public defender office budgets, are now set by a committee of judges. That's based upon a work measurement study that the judges mandated and accelerated for that purpose. CJA attorneys also have a tremendous amount of judicial involvement. It starts at the appointment or being placed on the panel. There's judicial involvement in that to various degrees. It comes in with the appointment of cases once the attorney is on the panel, and then it goes to the review of their vouchers when they submit that for reasonableness. And the judges see these attorneys for only a very small period of time that the attorney spends working on the case itself. And that's the time that they're in court. The attorneys are not present. They're not able to see the time that's spent on discovery, 
reviewing that discovery, the necessary legal research, going to visit their clients in jail, explaining the guidelines, the long conversations on whether you should go to trial, whether you should plead, the advantages and disadvantages to both, working with those clients who are mentally ill, not to the point of being criminally insane, not to the point of being incompetent to assist their attorney, but yet have a true mental illness and all the time that it takes to work through with that client to make sure they have an understanding of what is happening. CJ attorneys also have, have to go and ask for experts if they need them. Based on the testimony I've heard over the last two days, it doesn't seem that CJ attorneys ask for experts very often, but when they do, it's judges that decide whether they get that expert and then the budget for that expert. And when you couple that with the fact that there are a lot of or many of the judges who were involved in this review process who were tasked with these responsibilities have never represented a criminal defendant and certainly have not represented an appointed criminal defendant. We're placing a burden on the judiciary that shouldn't have been placed there. Judges need to be given more time to do what judges do interpret the law, apply the law, have hearings. And the accounting functions and that type of thing, the judges shouldn't have to be spending their time on that. I think the time has come for the, both the Federal Public Defender Program and the Criminal Justice Act Attorney Program to have its independence from the judiciary and have the management and the implementation of those programs be done by other than the judiciary. Thank you. Mr. Mark. Yes, ma'am. As it might not come to a surprise, given the color of my hair and the wrinkles in my skin, I knew Judge Prado before there was a Prado committee. <laughs> and although um, <laughs> he's, weathered, he's weathered the storm since better. That's your limitation. <laughs> <laughs> it goes both ways. I'm appreciative of that. Uh, I, I, I want to say that we disagreed um, on a number of issues at the time, but I have considered his uh, friendship to me personally and to our program over the 20 years or so since then is a real uh, a real gift. Uh, as you know from my written statement, I have a tendency to sort of ramble almost incoherently, and so I'm going to be as brief as I can now but um, and, and then available for any questions. What I came prepared to talk about uh, are three or four things, um, but I've been around long enough that there odds are I've experienced most anything you have a question about and would share my uh, perspective or experience on that. I first want to uh, agree with those of my uh, comrades who have said to you that the most important challenge we think that you face is addressing the concerns of the panel lawyers regarding the selection of the attorneys, the compensation, and the availability of uh, resources uh, to those people. Secondly, I'll give you just a, a brief update of, of where the defenders are uh, collectively um, in this process and, and, and what to anticipate uh, in the future. Um, third, I would add uh, to the uh, treasure of information that you've been providing uh, my anecdotal experiences as a defender in the Middle District of Tennessee through the tenures of, I think, six chief district judges, I think at least six chief circuit judges. I've lost count, I think, at 10 uh, United States uh, attorneys. Um, and, <clears throat> so I, and, and we have a, 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 a vibrant and, and, and excellent um, panel and relationship with the panel, and so I will um, answer any questions that you might have um, about that experience. And lastly, I would like to share with you um, just sort of a positive uh, spin on the on 30 years under the um, uh, uh, supervision of the judiciary. Um, you hear uh, and have heard from what I have uh, seen this week and, and in prior um, uh, hearings, uh, the problems with, with supervision by the judiciary, but it's not, it has not been, in my experience, uh, a negative uh, experience over the years. There have been an awful lot of positive um, aspects of that relationship. Uh, and I would, I would want to address just uh, briefly, um, if asked, how, that, uh, how I have seen that play out in a fairly crucial area, and that's the uh, death penalty litigation. Um, and some, maybe some background on the, uh, the people that you saw yesterday and, and what they represent in terms of the program uh, structure uh, today. Uh, and with, uh, with those introductory remarks, I want to share also my appreciation for uh, what you're doing and the hard task that you face and the sacrifices that you make in your professional lives uh, to do this. I am really impressed with the commitment that you uh, have shown and are showing, and I, I appreciate it. Ms. Myers. 
we're going to talk about everything. <laughs> um, I'm Margie Myers from the Southern District of Texas, and, and I echo um, the appreciation for the work that all of you are doing and um, the, my belief that this is an excellent program. And as Beth said, it's an excellent program that can be made better. Um, I do think the Southern District of Texas demonstrates some of the issues and problems with the current structure. And so I thought about highlighting that and then addressing some of the concerns I've he heard over the past two days. As you know from my written testimony, the Southern District of Texas, along with the Western District of Texas, has an overwhelming caseload. We're not alone. The judges do, too. Um, but we have been unable through the years to obtain relief. And I believe we are essentially caught in a vice between a district court that really appreciates our work, um, and that's a mixed blessing because they rely on us to do more than 75% of the cases. Um, that is in part because some of those divisions, at least in the past, did not have a panel. And they feel confident that even when we are overwhelmed, we will be the best attorney by far of any attorney who could appear in their courts. Um, I, am, I adamantly am opposed to circuit control of the number of attorney positions. And I think that the Fifth Circuit defenders are an example of the disparity that has been created by different judicial views of how many attorneys you should have. One need look no farther than Western and Southern Texas and Arizona, which is in the Ninth Circuit. And the um, number of attorneys that those, judge, that those defenders have and the number of attorneys that we have. And it is controlled by different judicial philosophies that do not necessarily have any bearing on the quality of defense. Um, we have also suffered, and I know you heard from Maureen Franco, from uh, the view of Washington. Um, not only have we traditionally not been given the number of attorneys that we needed, but Washington, at least until the work measurement study, has let that continue. In my written testimony, I talk about caseloads that were unbearable, and when our caseload actually went down from 30,000 to 27,000, um, Washington had the nerve to say, your caseload is going down, you should get rid of attorneys. And when I objected to that, I was told, you've done it for years. You can continue to do it for years. Um, so I think, as I say, this is an example of the way that neither Washington nor um, circuit control has um, been in our best interest or the interest of the clients. Um, there's been a lot of discussion about the panel, and I join everybody. I think the panel is the biggest issue. And, and um, just for what it's worth, I share the view, I think, of most of my fellow defenders that the judge, in particular the trial judge, should not be deciding who the experts are and should not be reviewing the vouchers. I think there is at least an appearance of a conflict of interest, and I don't think that the court should be involved in determining how the defense goes. Now, I know in, um, and I've heard, I think there are different models. I see that Joe Sanamon says, well, who's going to review it? You've heard models today, whether it's the federal defender. And I will say with my caseload, do not give me that task <laughs> unless you give me about 10 other people to do it. Um, but I do think we've seen various models, and they don't have to be exclusive, which could be either the federal defender. It could be an attorney who works in the court, similar to a budget attorney, someone with experience who could review those vouchers. In Portland, Judge Fisher raised a concern about if another judge says I don't get this expert, it's my trial. And um, I appreciate that. And I do think that virtually all of the judges want the trial to be fair. And perhaps we could have a review where if, the, if I was denied the expert as a panel lawyer, I could approach the trial judge and say, I want this. And then as the trial judge, you would have a second opportunity to decide what to do with that. Um, we've heard a lot about the rates and a lot of people saying, well, everybody wants to be on the panel anyway. That is true in the Southern District of Texas. We have one division where you don't have a choice. Um, 
but I am reminded of a conversation I overheard when my daughter came back from college and was looking for a summer job and she was on the phone and the employer asked her presumably how much she wanted to make and her response was I need to make at least minimum wage. Um, if you want the job and you want to be in federal court, in many instances it is not the rate that is preventing that. What is, pro what is a problem are the cuts the lack of expert services, and I think the lack, and this was identified by the Prado Commission, the continuing view of many members of the judiciary that this is partially a pro bono obligation. It is not. It should not be. Judge Crone talked about the awesome responsibility of presiding over a capital trial. It is unconscionable that the only person in the room the, not the judge, not the prosecutor, is not being paid a full and fair wage to represent somebody whose life and liberty is at stake. Um, in terms of structure, um, as I've indicated in my testimony, not only have I been doing this work since 1983 and I actually clerked on the Fifth Circuit when Birmingham was in the Fifth Circuit, um, that's the closest I ever got to being on the Fifth Circuit. Um, but uh, I am a member of DSAG and um, have also been active in a number of other committees. And um, I will say that the current structure, I think, is untenable. Uh, Dr. Rucker, you asked, I think, yesterday how changing the org chart might make a difference. I, I, certainly at a minimum, we need to change the org, org chart. But it would make a difference not just in the perspective. But also, I do think that particularly since 2013 and sequestration, the demotion of defender services has resulted in interference and micromanaging by judges who have no comprehension of what we do and who are concerned about cost more than and their own budgets more than they are concerned about justice. And I will say that we had an incredible support from the district court and most of the circuit judges during sequestration. But sequestration was an, a, an example where we were not protected by the judiciary, we were decimated. And that cannot happen again. Whether we can trust Congress, being from Texas, probably not. Um, but uh, it depends. And we cannot be um, subject to some years we have judges who are completely supportive some years we don't, and it should not be the judges making those decisions. And there are other changes that could be made. I think I probably come down on the idea now of a center within the judiciary just because I do remember the Ronald Reagan era, era and legal aid, although I do think that we have been effective with Congress. But for example, we should be able, as the Prado Commission recommended, to directly argue for our budget rather than this antiquated budget, budget process that goes to ver through various levels. We should be able to speak on matters of policy for criminal defendants without the blessing of the judicial conference because there will be times when our position on matters of criminal law is not surprisingly different from the judicial conference. All of us want the best, but the view of judges may be different than criminal advocates. Um, so I. Again, I applaud your work. I think you have a tough job, um, but I think that there do need to be drastic changes. Ms. Randall Holt. Thank you. I promise I will be brief. <laughs> um, I'm in the Western District of Tennessee where we have two offices, one in Memphis and one in Jackson, Tennessee. Uh, I've been the defender for almost three years. Uh, it will be three years on the 21st of April. In the Western District, there are two panels. And there's a panel of 38 in Memphis, a panel of 20 in Jackson. The panel is managed by the district court in my district. And it is preferred to be that way by our panel members. And for two reasons that they you know, announced. Number one is because they believe it's a conflict for the defender to manage the panel. And number two is because of the past makeup of the panel. Today, our panel is very diverse. 
but in past years, it was not. So the panel members like it the way it is. But if for some reason this committee recommends and it is approved that the defenders should manage the panel, I would be glad to do that in my office. Now the defender's office uh, plays a key role in the admission to the panel in the Western District. Uh, it's, it's, uh, admission is by committee. committee. The committee consists of the district court judge, a magistrate judge, the defender, and two panel attorneys. So the defender is not really given any responsibilities to this panel. Uh, unless specifically asked by the district court judge. And recently, we were asked if we would mentor uh, young attorneys that were interested in becoming members of the panel. So I took it upon myself to write up some rules of what the process would be, that you know we would meet with them on a Saturday. We we're gonna take them from beginning to end, how to try a federal criminal case. I've put on seminars specific to uh, training young lawyers how to try cases in federal court. We've started uh, putting on at least two seminars a year. Last year, I did three seminars and four webinars in our office, and we did the seminars at the law school. So we are, we're participating in some training for the panel. In the Western District, we do not have a capital habeas unit. We do not have a non-capital uh, habeas unit. I was told during my interview for Defender, it was not likely that we would get one, since there is one in the Middle District of Tennessee and the Eastern District of Tennessee. As far as diversity is concerned in the Western District, uh, as you can probably see from my materials, I started with this office as an assistant in 1989. I was the only lawyer of color in that office. And, and it's been that way for a long, long time. Um, but from time to time, we would have another uh, minority to come through the office, but uh, they didn't stay. I was the only one that stayed. But today, since I've taken over, we have four uh, African-American attorneys. We have one Asian attorney. And out of a staff of 23, 11 people in my office are minorities today. And the last thing I want to talk to you all about was transportation for unconvicted citizens. I think the transportation and subsistence are insufficient. You know, our clients, most of our clients in Memphis come from Texas. They're caught on 40 with drugs, the Marge's people. But, you know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they're stopped. They have to get back home to Texas. I can bring them to court, you all know, under 4285. I can bring them to court, but they're stranded on the streets after court. So as a lawyer, I feel that I have to be creative in talking to my client to say, look, um, you think maybe you can get somebody to drive you? Because if you can get somebody to drive you, I can put in my motion that you're going to come by car and we'll pay you mileage and it'll probably be enough to get you back home. You know, but why do we have to do that? It's, that's not feasible when the client is from California. When he's from California, you got to bring him in by plane to try to get him there in time for court and then it's out of my pocket or my lawyer, we, we, everybody's pitching in to try to buy a bus ticket to get this person home. So we're hoping that something changes there. All right, thank you. Um, I'm going to let the committee ask questions, but I, I just wanted to follow up on something that you said, Ms. Myers, So I'm, uh, because I think it's a topic that we've not heard before, um, but that you raised, and that is um, the ability to make commentary. Um, in other words, to take positions on things that affect your clients. Can you expound a little bit on what your concern there is? Um. I actually wasn't even aware of this until Portland when um, people from Defender Services talked about it. That, for example, when the, there was a debate about what the judicial conference should say about making drugs minus two retroactive, my understanding is the judicial conference's concern was it would be too much work for the probation officers. Now, 
That is not our concern. And that we could not take a position that was different. The Defender Services wanted to say that defenders support retroactivity of drugs minus two. It will reduce sentences for thousands of people who deserve it. And that Defender Services was told you cannot take a position that is inconsistent with the judicial conference because you're part of the judiciary. I think that's an easy enough fix. It makes no sense to me the way it is now. Well, is it also my understanding that not only are you, um, you can't take a position that's contrary to that, even if it's contrary to your client's positions, but that you are subject to all the rules of the judiciary? Yes, and so, and that also raises the other issue, which I didn't read in my notes about, which was a recommendation of the original report that we should be able to directly advocate for our budget at Congress rather than going through um, the different committees, because we're familiar with our budget. Um, and we know the needs, leaving aside the competition issue, but yes. All right, uh, we'll start with Judge Fisher. Uh, thank you, we could probably use an hour with each of you, so we'll, we'll do our best to get the information that we need. Uh, maybe do a little picking and choosing. Ms. Uh, Ford, you started out, uh, your letter was saying you uh, are a wannabe teacher and you uh, you flashed a report card. Uh, I don't think you. I don't think you included that with your materials. But I saw a lot of C's and D's, so that's <laughs> that's not good. Uh, I don't think any of us would have thought that was good. Uh, could I just focus on your uh, suggestions at the end? And you called them musings, but they're far from uh, musings. Uh, their important issues. Could you tell me specifically, and I think Ms. Myers started to mention this, but you talk about reviewing the governing and advisory structure, which included DSAG. Could you tell me if you have any uh, specifics about what we should be looking for in the review or what recommendations we should be making with regard to that specifically? Well, I think this is also part of having to deal with the rules of the administrative office of, of the courts. Um, DSAG is the, the perfect current example. Um, the membership on DSAG was evidently established many, many years ago when there were not very many federal defender offices in the country. And as a result, the membership is a, a conglomeration of we have a representative for the first, second, and third circuits, something that no longer makes any sense because there are now def uh, defenders in, multiple defenders in those three circuits. Uh, but when the, the suggestion was first made that DSAG should be expanded, the, the response that we received was, well, we've got to look at how the AO considers uh, working groups and advisory groups. Uh, so I think that we need the flexibility to, to change uh, how we provide advice and how we uh, talk through and work through issues without being hamstrung by rules that really don't apply to us in our situation. Does anybody have any different thoughts or additional thoughts on DSAG? Okay, uh, Ms. Freeman, you talked about uh, the 4285 issue as well, and you mentioned that uh, you're housing some of your clients at the Salvation Army and, and halfway houses. Uh, do you have any idea of how often that happens? We're trying to figure out the scope of the problem and the... Okay. And I would say that... Um, but with, with anyone who is from out of the district who has to return for court, they will have a problem. So we've had, um, I've had some clients who slept overnight in their truck, which I learned about later, um, or who uh, drove with a friend and the friend paid for their motel room. Um, it just has, it's, it's just not a, a good system at all right now. Thank you. And you mentioned the ancillary service caps are too low. We've, we've heard a lot about that, and I think Dr. Rucker's asked the question before, but do you have a suggestion about what the cap should be? And I'll ask if anybody uh, does, because you obviously s see a lot of 
uh, experts, which strangely includes uh, investigators and paralegals, and mm -hmm. may have a better handle on what it costs. Well, I, I heard Judge Shirley's comment about mental health experts, and I completely agree with that. I mean, we don't pay. Uh, after the evaluation process and writing the report and testimony, um, you really are going to be paying at least five to six thousand dollars at a minimum um, for a mental health expert. Um, I would also say that in any case that involves computer forensics, you're clearly going to go into twenty or thirty thousand dollars. So, um, while I understand that might be deemed an extraordinary expense, I think in a type of case um, that that should not that's routine in, in certain types of cases, and so it shouldn't be treated as extraordinary where you have to go through this layered approach to get approval for it um, when everyone knows that's what will be needed in this any certain type of case. Does anybody have a specific number that you think makes sense other than pulling a number out of the air for that cat? Well, I would think at least 8,000. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Eddy, you mentioned uh, Arbitrary cutting and judges setting uh, the hourly rate. Is the hourly rate in your district less than the 129 now? No, ma'am, it's not. Okay. Uh, do you have a suggestion, uh, and we, we talked about this in some earlier panels, uh, someone, I think it was Ms. Ford mentioned, let's, let's have a base rate, but maybe adjust upward for cost of living. Um, is everybody feel that the the 129 is either sufficient or it should be raised at least to the 140 something, whatever the maximum. Does any, anybody think that shouldn't happen? I guess is maybe a better. I don't, I'm not hearing any. I think the process for raising it should be different. It shouldn't be such a struggle. There should be. It should be tied to the cost of living increases, or there should should be some pattern so that we don't have these tremendous fights periodically. Thank you. Can I add something to sure. that? The, I've generally agreed with most of what I heard yesterday that the, the rate itself has not been a problem in getting quality representation of the panel. But I'm not sure that's going to continue into the future. Most districts are seeing a decline in caseloads, which is hurting our offices, but it's also hurting the panel lawyers, many of whom either don't necessarily live entirely on that, but it's a substantial portion of their income. And if they're getting fewer appointments, it is going to be harder for them to maintain the, their familiarity with the cases and their interest in the panel. And I think a, a, an increase uh, in, the, in the rate uh, will make a difference in that. Thank you. Mr. Eddy, you, you also mentioned uh, we should consider uh, the Sentencing Commission or FJC Model 501C3. Do you have information about how those work that you can say, here, here's how it would work, here's how we would adapt that model? You know, I don't. I, I think that independence is necessary, and I think that's the first decision that has to be made, whether it's independent or not. And if the decision for independence is reached, then I think there would have to be a hard look at the different models that are out there to see which would probably fit the best. But I wouldn't, at this time, have enough information to advocate one over another, just that there are a variety of models that could be studied. Okay, thank you. May I add one, sure. one thing to that? Uh, there is the, the PDS model, and I've had several conversations with Avis Buchanan about the challenges that they face and her opinion about the success of that model. And of course, she feels very strongly that that is the, the best model for providing uh, criminal defense services. Right, thank you. Um, Mr. Martin, you talked about the, uh, the morale-crushing work measurement study, and we've heard, I guess we've heard some, some sort of you know, good things about it and, and uh, not so good things. Uh, one of you mentioned how in the world can you tell us that we need to wait two years to, to figure out what's going on. Um, do you have some specific comments about how that work study uh, impacted morale adversely? It was um, an insult um, that to be the only um, party in the criminal justice system whose um, work efforts um, and value and efficiency were questioned and to have to justify and prove it. Uh, and for me to be in a position to tell a lawyer when he or she has come back 
uh, from a hard day in the in the courtroom or, or, or traveling you know across the state to a jail and, and explaining something to a client that doesn't understand it that before you go home you know get down sit down on your computer and enter you know by five or six minute increments what you've done today um, and it's because we're not trusted it was just um, it was an insult well as I understand it uh, and I'm not disagreeing with you. We don't like it when anybody tries to, you know, they were, they were marking down the number of minutes we were on the bench, too. So, uh, but as I understand it, the this result of the study was that you were all incredibly efficient, good stewards of your money, and probably needed more people than you have, although they're going to cut all of, or almost all of your, your districts. Uh, am I wrong about that, or it was just still aggravating? Well, no, I think, I don't think that the, I think the, the morale problem was pretty much what I described. I mean, it really was, it was, it was, it was laborious to do it. It, it, it was, uh, it was added on to, the, we already had too much work to do. But the, the other reason that I, that I think it did affect the morale, and mine maybe more so than, than my staff, is that I really didn't see it ultimately as being a long-term benefit to us. It may have temporarily saved us because it showed that we do work more than, than they thought we work, but all it did was measure what we've been doing, not what we should be doing. And, and, it, and it doesn't, it didn't have any way to, to address that or to anticipate the changes and, and new challenges that would come to us um, that, that in the past we've been able to, to adjust to. Do you think there's a structure, I don't know whether it's the FJC or the Sentencing Commission or, or some other independent structure where you're not going to be accountable in some fashion oh, no, to the bureaucracy. No, and I, you know, I have a fear of a bureaucracy of an independent organization about as much as I do of the of the administrative office of the U.S. courts. I, I will say I, I had promised in my opening um, statement that, uh, to give you an update. The defenders, as I'm sure you're aware, have been really active in this um, and and on our own, talking on telephone and meeting and, and exchanging emails. Um, and we are in the process of, uh, of, of developing what we hope will be um, at least a consensus and maybe the, the reflect the opinion of the, of the majority of defenders on the key issues that you're addressing, and in particular on the national structure. And our hope is that we will get something to you that will answer, uh, like the questions that you just asked uh, Bruce about what form this will take. Um, in addition to, to specific recommendations on things less, um, uh, less centralized than that. Um, and hopefully by one of your last couple of hearings, so there would be somebody here from the association having presented it to you in advance and able to answer questions um, about it. We'll take all the help we can get. Ms. Myers, you mentioned um, a couple of things that suggest to me that maybe your relationship with the district court isn't the best. You, you said the district wouldn't give you the drugs minus two or the the Johnson lists and, and maybe the district and the circuit don't agree on, on what kinds of cases or how many cases should be given to the panel. Could you tell us a little bit more about those relationships? Um, I mean, as I said also, in general, the relationship with the district court is very good. I, I think um, the, um, as I've said, they have refused to give us the lists. They, the position of the district court and the district court in general, what they did, which is what they always do, and our chief judges have always said, as anyone who's been a chief judge, that being a chief judge is like herding cats. Um, but what they do is say, we won't take a position, we'll let individual judges decide. So we're, there were, say, three judges who gave us the drug retro cases. Um, it is the view of many members of our district court, and I don't know about the circuit, that our responsibility ends once the case is final and that that is why they will not um, give us the list even on the Johnson cases because as far as they're concerned, they are not our clients. Now, whether that's a CJA problem or a judicial view, um, yesterday someone was asking about whether judges had ever called to complain or anything. I mean, I had a judge ban a lawyer for a year, um, I've, but I've also seen judges ban U.S. attorneys for life. So I, I'm not sure that that's a CJA problem as much as a black robe problem. Um, but I, I, I'm not sure that CJA can address that other than to recommend that, for example, on instances like clemency, the statute do be amended to specify 
that we could have done clemency because it's a disaster that the defenders were not permitted to do that. Right. All right. Well, I, I, I won't go into then <laughs> that it's under the ancillary services. <laughs> you it's could. not. That's the problem. <laughs> it's related. Okay. Uh, Ms. Randall Holt, could you tell us just a little bit more because I, I think this is a very interesting subject because what we're hearing from a lot of uh, defender offices is at least they have some uh, input in the process and the, uh, the issue of the question of conflict and whether the CJA lawyers would really like the FPD uh, to be more involved uh, is something we really need to take a look at because that's certainly some, something that's one of the alternatives. And so I'm interested to hear uh, why, if they express a view or if you have a view, why the panel attorneys in your district uh, don't want you more involved. Does that mean they're, they're not having their vouchers cut, they're getting all the appointments they want, they like who gets put on the panel, that kind of thing? Or, or they're just, are they just saying conflict, or you think that's, that's real? You know, I really don't know. Um, in the 27 years I've worked in the office, uh, it has always been that way, but I guess there was a time when the defender played more of a role in um, admitting people to the panel. It wasn't a clear-cut process like there is now with a panel committee. Uh, I think it may have been just a defender. People would go to the... Henry ran my office for a while. <laughs> uh, there were... I think they could maybe contact the defender and he could get them on the panel. And but it wasn't until maybe 2005 um, until a district court judge was assigned to work with uh, panel admission because, I mean, the real problem was that we had an all-white panel. There was not one person of color, a minor, any on that panel. And our judges in the district just decided this can't continue because we have minority lawyers practicing in federal court. And so a judge was assigned to work on this and lawyers uh, that practice in federal court were admitted to the panel and the ball was rolling. But it has always been that um, the court had more of an influence of people being admitted to the panel, but they did give the defender some role. You know, in the history of my office, we've only had, I'm the third defender. Is there anyone who, who actually reviews the vouchers and the requests for experts that feels that there is a conflict? I'll review. We, don't do it. we review just for um, mathematics and compensability and at the request of a district judge on a fairly rare occasion for um, reasonableness. Um, and I've never had a question. And we also assign cases, which would be a potential area for conflict as well. And I've, I've never um, felt conflicted in, to the extent that I'm involved in it personally, and I've never, there's never been a complaint either from the court or the U.S. attorneys or panel members about the existence of a conflict or a conflict being a problem. Thank you. Thank you, Judge Cardone. All right. Ms. Rowe. Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Myers, I wanted to begin with you. I want to talk a little bit about, um, you, you said that the 5th District and the 9th District, Texas and Arizona essentially, were a great example of the disparity uh, when the circuit court, I'm sorry, at the circuit, when the circuit court controls how many lawyers are in a federal defender office. Can you explain that more fully? Um, it is a huge struggle number one, to get the circuit to approve lawyers. And I, I, I was thinking about that when there was a discussion about whether panel lawyers ask for um, experts, because we don't always ask. The message has come down very clear. I, I did in my testimony give an example. When we asked for 12, we got nine. And the message at that point was, don't come back. Um, we eventually did come back. Um, so 
and just the caseloads. We have the same docket, um, and the weighted caseload in Arizona and even New Mexico is so much lower than it is in western and southern Texas, and even throughout the Fifth Circuit. As um, that, that's what I mean. I mean, I think when you have a circuit that basically, if the defender says they need attorneys, the circuit approves it, which is my understanding of what the Ninth Circuit does. Um, some of you are from the Ninth Circuit. That it means you get what you need, um, as opposed to having to struggle with less. So in Texas, you ask for the attorneys, or don't ask for the attorneys because you're told not to come back and ask anymore, but you have more cases than the other border offices, if you will, in Arizona and New Mexico, but they go to the Ninth Circuit, ask for the attorneys, and they get the attorneys. Is, okay. and, and it affects the nature of our practice. Uh, I'm very proud of our lawyers, but um, I've had lawyers carrying 90 to 100 felonies. My, my lawyers every year write an annual letter talking about how they did. And that one year in particular, I got law letters from three of those lawyers. Lots of the letters are like, this is my letter for the raise. These are all the great things I did. But I asked them to talk about problems. And um, one of the things the circuit always gets upset with us about is plain error re review. Um, and <coughs> uh, we are always, the appellate division's always saying to the trial lawyers, plain error review means our client was in jail. And a number of those lawyers wrote about reviewing everything for sentencing the day before sentencing again and noticing an error, usually a criminal history error. And they said, I wonder how many other errors there are that I didn't catch, that no one will catch because there wasn't an appeal. And we had times on the border where lawyers were unable to attend PSR interviews. Um, that's not effective assistance of counsel. And I know that doesn't go on in the Ninth and Tenth Circuits. Let me ask you about, um, I think something you were talking about earlier was that sometimes the assistant federal defenders are really the only folks who are able or there to represent people in some of your divisions. Can you tell us why you think that in those divisions there are no more CJA, available, CJA lawyers available? Is it the rate? Is it the um, kind of the pressure of having to handle so many cases? Can you, can you give us an idea about that? There are CJA lawyers available, and as I say, in, in one division you practice in federal court, you are on the panel. Um, but, and, and I think that in some areas, particularly because most of the divisions are trying to have a panel, it's better. Um, but the district court continues, I mean, I, in some ways it's a testament to our effectiveness, but the district court continues to prefer to appoint us. Sometimes I think it's easier, for example, of those 30,000, lots of those are misdemeanor cases that come in that day. And um, there are other places, I think El Paso, the defender doesn't do the uh, misdemeanors at all, I don't know. Um, when I, particularly during sequestration, asked that the misdemeanors be reduced, that we take half, and it would be a good way to get new lawyers into court doing misdemeanors, can't do too much damage, we would be there. It was shut down. We want the defenders doing it. We don't have to worry about it. Thank you. Mr. Martin, I'm uh, wondering if you could uh, just kind of give us an overview of your administration of the panel. We've heard a number of different um, models, if you will, of how different organizations administer the panel. I know you talked a little bit about not feeling like there was a conflict, uh, walling it off or whatever that you do to, to make sure that, that there's not a conflict. And But um, what do you actually do as far as panel administration? We, it, we have a, it's a limited uh, size panel that now I think has 65 people on it. They serve renewable three-year terms with a presumption of renewal. The selection committee now consists of the chief judge of the district, me, and three, no, I'm sorry, five now uh, senior panel members. We meet once a year to consider um, the renewal uh, uh, portion of the panel. Um, and in new applicants. Um, in advance of that meeting, we will have uh, reviewed both a, a fairly comprehensive written application 
uh, and the notes from um, an interview that would have been conducted with each applicant by me and at least one or two members of the, uh, of the selection committee or, me or members of my staff. <clears throat> and then we'll make a decision based on the needs uh, for more lawyers, uh, based on uh, uh, departures from the panel or increase in caseload. Um, and the merits of the applicants, and, and so the, and the people either go on or don't go on uh, then. When they're on the panel, we have, it's basically a rotating number. I mean, whoever, if you're up next, you get the call when the call comes in. Um, and and uh, the, the committee and the court has allowed variation from that as, basically as I deemed appropriate. Uh, if there were, and that would more often be in reappointment cases when the, this, I'll be, we're looking for the second or third lawyer because of, uh, of failed um, relationships. Uh, and that gives me the opportunity to select somebody that I know works well with difficult clients, that'll spend the time with them and has the experience and, and that maybe can rescue the relationship. Or if there is a particularly um, complex case and the next person up, is a brand new member of the panel, then, then I've been given the discretion to go to somebody else to make sure there'd be an appropriate appointment. When the, we, um, um, so we, we do make the assignments, we do all the paperwork to get, to get them uh, uh, entered in the case. Um, we, we, when they submit vouchers or when the experts submit vouchers, we'll review those vouchers, uh, as I said earlier, uh, mainly for uh, math and compensability and then forward them on to the court and then track them you know, through the system to get the uh, payments make sure that they're uh, processed appropriately. Um, and, and then again, on, on uh, half a dozen or less occasions, um, I've either asked to be um, allowed to uh, opine on reasonableness or have been asked by a judge uh, to do so. And on some particularly complex ones, I have invited uh, members of the selection committee to participate that in, in, as well. And so it wouldn't seem as it's something personal uh, to me. Um, and so and, and we have, uh, I, I'm not reviewing interim vouchers um, other than my, the, my panel administrator. I have one full-time person who administers the panel doing what I've described uh, and doing all the, all the CLE mechanics uh, for the CLE programs we run. Uh, but I, 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 don't, I don't know that I've ever seen an interim voucher, and that's where I think a conflict in the voucher process would be most likely to occur, because then I'd find out what somebody um, uh, in a, for a co-defendant was, was, was trying to do. What about, ex what about expert vouchers? Are you reviewing those? We're reviewing the, 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 the ex parte submission is made without our involvement. Um, and if the judge, or if it's you know, below the limits, uh, the initial uh, retainer, the, the, w once the authorization comes and then, then the voucher will come to us, uh, we, are, we can provide assistance on things like travel and stuff uh, for experts. But we're, 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 not doing, we're not involved at all in whether or not an expert should be authorized or how much should be authorized. It's just the administration of the payment of, the, of that expert. How about if a voucher is cut? Does that come back over your desk? It, it can. It doesn't, does not automatically. Um, and, and lately, we've had very little problems with that. Um, and the, the, I've got one ongoing situation now that so far my efforts to come up with a solution have been unsuccessful. But by and large, there are not uh, cuts made. Uh, now, the, we, you know, if we, our, my panel administrator may well see something that is either <coughs> duplicative or not compensable, and, 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 the, and there'll be a self-cut, there'll be a, a correction of that. But we're, my question more is when the, when the uh, voucher comes back from the circuit, if it's uh, excess compensation and it comes back from the circuit, or even if it's not excess compensation, it comes back from the district court. Does it pass through your desk? Are you someone who has to kind of sign and see that? No, my, my panel administrator will, will know about it. Um, and again, we're not seeing uh, circuit cuts now. We, we had a, a long period of time when even judges who were very supportive believed that there was a Sixth Circuit appropriation that they had to keep track of and, and, and they, there would be cuts for that, and there's nothing, we, had, we were unsuccessful in, 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 in convincing them that there was not a Sixth Circuit appropriation. But other than that, and currently now, we're, it's a, I, I, the uh, 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 circuit uh, uh, clerk addressed this a little bit, the, the existence of a panel liaison uh, on, uh, in the circuit has made an uh, extraordinary difference in, in the management of panel resources on, on, on big cases. It's, which worked very well. So. And that's a Sixth Circuit, that's, uh, is that Mr. Rance that they were talking about yes, earlier? Right. So you've seen the difference in the, in the difference uh, in the voucher cuts since they've 
Absolutely. the case budgeting attorney. Not only on. in the cuts, but in the, in the authorization, uh, particularly in, in a timely way, in whether they're capital cases or just otherwise complex cases. The, the judges, both in the circuit and the district, have come to trust his assistance. Um, and, and he's he's worked well at, at you know at, at moderating costs and in, in making sure that what was needed was authorized, uh, and so it has smoothed that process and made the resources available in a more timely way and substantially, if not entirely, reduced uh, cut uh, problems, voucher cutting problems. May I interject one thing about Bob Rands? It, it was asked earlier what his background uh, is. He was a uh, he was actually a public defender, and I think that that is the perfect example of someone who really understands what the work is being able then to do the job that needs to be done in that position, that, that specialized knowledge. And he has a very good relationship with the panel lawyers all through the, through the circuit. Uh, and uh, as Henry said, I don't think that there have been cuts to speak of as a result of his being there. Mr. Barton, let me also ask you, has your office, you've been the defender for 30 plus years in your district, has your office always had that same relationship with panel management? It, it, as the panel has grown and the work has grown, it's, it's, it's become a little more involved, but the structure has been the same since the very beginning. Thank you. Ms. Ford, um, can I ask you a question about the PDS model you spoke of earlier? Um, we, uh, all, as a committee, had the opportunity to sit down and speak with Ms. Buchanan also. The one thing that I think of when I think about the PDS model is, while it certainly is very, um, it's for, certainly working well for the District of Columbia, it's also on a much, much smaller scale. Have you um, given any thought to that? I have. Uh, I think that their request uh, was $48 million last year. They received the $48 million, but to compare that with a $1 billion appropriation, I know is, is not comparing apples to apples. So yes, I, depending on what day of the week it is, I sometimes think that's the way to go, and sometimes I don't think that's the way to go. I think members of the committee uh, have similar thoughts about different models. <laughs> it really depends on where we are in the country. <laughs> starts to sound good and then go somewhere else and it doesn't sound as good. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Uh, Eddie, one of the questions I wanted to ask you is the, the model that you were talking about, and I know it's just kind of in its formative stage, but um, did you have a thought about how that would be, fu the funding process would work? Would it be um, that the defenders were under the arm or the wing, if you will, of the judiciary and so the judiciary seeks the funding or would the defenders seek their own funding and stand alone? I would think that it would be better if the defenders, <clears throat> excuse me, sought their own funding. They know what they're doing. They know what the needs are. And I believe they can be more convincing with Congress and carrying the message to Congress than taking it through yet another layer. So I would envision it where the defenders could directly lobby Congress. Thank you. Thank you, Judge. Ms. Walton. What is the racial demographic of your client population in your two uh, offices? Well, in Memphis, it is about 75%, I think, African American. Now, in Jackson, Tennessee, it's probably a flip. Because <laughs> Jackson has a lot of, it, it encompasses uh, several, you know, like we're 22 counties, and a lot of the rural counties is, is mostly Caucasian. You said something that was very interesting uh, regarding diversity on the panel. And you said that until this judge became active in saying that things had to change, that diversity was not the norm. Right. Does that counter against judiciary getting out of the process, as some suggest? Well, in my district, I would say it's working. It was because the judiciary was in it that uh, we, we saw the change. Now that may not work somewhere else, just like the, the New Orleans model may not work somewhere else as well as it seemed to be working in New Orleans. But the panel members in the Western District appear to be very happy the way our panel is working. 
And I, I, I'm a firm believer, something not broke, don't try to fix it. <laughs> not in West Tennessee, I think they're happy. I have not seen a lot of voucher cutting like some of the other people were talking about. Uh, never heard the lawyers complain about that, except one lawyer, I did hear of one, he submitted a $79,000 voucher on a case that was thoroughly reviewed and uh, but anyway, it, I don't think it ever left the district because that lawyer was subsequently, you know, he was murdered. So I don't think the, I don't think the voucher went anywhere. You're not implying it had anything to do with the voucher. His, his, his heirs didn't seek to recover it. And the court didn't do it. So his, his estate didn't seek to recover it, though. No, not that I know of. I have not. Mr. Eddy, you have expressed the same uh, position that many others have expressed about the judiciary getting out of the process. And from my personal perspective and the perspective of most of the judges I've talked to, we'd be happy to accommodate you if Congress would be willing to do that. But my perspective and projection is that I don't know if Congress is going to be willing to let us off the hook. And if that is, in fact, the reality, what, if anything, would you recommend that we recommend be done to improve the process with the judiciary still involved in its supervisory role? I think that independence needs to be at least given within the judiciary. Have it where Defender Services or whatever name that that organization goes by is more responsive to the defenders and to the CJA attorneys. We sometimes complain about what Defender Services does, the positions they take, but yet they're an employee of the administrative office. So even if you're under the, the wing, the jurisdiction, if you will, of the judiciary, there needs to be a level of independence there. There needs to be an opportunity for the defenders to be able to put their budget together and be able to have a direct voice to Congress, even if it's going in under the judiciary, so that they can lobby for their own uh, budget. So even if you were to stay within the judiciary, changes need to be made so that there's independence there, so that the defenders, CJA attorneys have a voice to whatever body, whether it's defender services or some other structure under the judiciary that controls them, so that they have, they have a voice in that organization, and that organization reflects that voice and not that of the administrative office. One of the concerns I've heard expressed, and it's a concern that I have, is the apparent arbitrariness of some of my colleagues uh, in reference to the uh, approval of, of vouchers. And if judges are going to remain in the process, what, if anything, would you recommend to try and alleviate some of that, that, that uh, uh, attitude, I guess, of some judges of their desire to just cut indiscriminately for whatever reason? What could we do that could maybe put some limitations on the ability of judges to do that? You know, there could be a variety of things. There could be some type of a review committee set up that, that looked at that voucher before the judge received it to see whether the hours were reasonable. There would be people that had criminal defense experience that could look to see the time that was being spent the other charges to the case so that when the judge got it, especially if they don't have a background themselves in federal criminal defense, so that they would have some, some level of confidence that these charges that are going up to them are fair and reasonable. And then I think it just becomes education to the judges. The judges should not be required to reduce uh, vouchers by any percentage because they're trying to save money. There shouldn't be a, a field between the judges you have to reduce all vouchers by 25% or 10% or by any amount. Uh, going back to the New Orleans, uh, the model that they use, that seems to be working fairly well for them. And I think some model like that could be used for other judges where perhaps it's not the defender office, but it's somebody familiar with the defense function that reviews that voucher initially so that when the judge gets it, the reasonableness of, of the hours that were spent, the activities undertaken, the judge isn't having to go back and try to come up with whether that's reasonable without any personal um, experience to base that on. So I think that would be helpful to judges, along with education, that there is not a nationwide 
requirement that vouchers be cut a particular percentage? Should we be required that if we're going to cut, that we articulate that in writing? Otherwise, if you're not willing to do that, you can't cut? I believe so, because if a judge is going to cut a voucher, there should be, and I would think there would be a reason for why that judge is cutting it. And the judge ought to be able to articulate that. There should be some type of, of a review process of that judge's decision uh, to see whether or not that is a legitimate and a good reason. Uh, and I think that that would help tremendously, because at least the panel attorneys then would know why their voucher is being cut. And if they wanted to try to uh, appeal that, there should be some uh, process whereby to do that. Thank you. Can I just add along? I think the intermediary model helps because there's been discussion about whether the judge should call the lawyer and about the voucher and whether that's chilling. And it really depends on the judge. Um, but the intermediary, it sounds like, for example, in New Orleans, can say to the lawyer, why are you billing that? At? And work out the things that can be worked out before it goes to the judge without that inevitable um, chilling effect that all of you have, whether you like it or not. Dr. Rucker. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to continue with this theme, if I may, about possible different uh, structures that we may have or consider. And I don't, I agree with Judge Walton, I'm not sure where we can go with this and what we can really accomplish, but uh, let me toss out one idea uh, and then ask you to respond to that and what your thoughts are about that. But I'd also like to ask you about if you have any ideas about what you would think would be the ideal structure. Uh, I, I know a lot of you uh, issued uh, in, your, in your writings uh, concerns about the way the structure is right now, and a lot of it is focused on the district court. But one of the things with the excess vouchers, it goes to the Court of Appeals. And those judges really don't know very much about these cases at all and don't have hardly any contact at all with the attorneys. Should they be kept in this process or should that, should we recommend eliminating that? And I, I would, let me start with Ms. Myers. I would take them out. Um, but I, but that also comes from, I, I, I would take the, the judges out in general and, and, and leave it to somebody like a public, former public defender, I, th I think that works better. But I think you identify the problem on the excess vouchers. And my own experience with the circuit, it's gotten much better, but it shouldn't depend on who's in charge of the vouchers, whether it's gotten better. Mr. Martin. I don't think that the circuit review adds anything substantively other than a workload. There's, there's the potential that um, a judge who had time and, and interest to, to compare what he or she was getting from the different districts might see um, um, aberrations in the practices and might take the initiative to try to uh, address that, but that's not really likely to, to happen. And I don't think, I, I agree with you, I don't think a, the, the judge designated by the Court of Appeals is, is likely to have any insights into an individual case that hadn't even come before them yet. Ms. Randall Holt. Well, you know, I, I, I really like that uh, Louisiana model. I like that model. I think the uh, judges ought to just, you know, be the final person to review it once the voucher has gotten to them. And if, as far as going to the circuit, um, I, I like the model where the, the attorney reviews it and, and helps the lawyers with their budgets and review it. So if I think that one will work everywhere. I'd, I'd like to address this only because I, I watched the CJA attorney from Puerto Rico's testimony. And it just seems to me there has to be an appeal process. Um, it's, it, there are too many instances where this is a matter that cannot be resolved in a friendly conversation and informally by people who both know uh, what the case really involved and what they're talking about. And there needs to be um, some kind of due process or appeal when someone is being, um, feels strongly that they're being denied adequate pay. Mr. Eddy? I agree with Margie. I would think that that eliminating judges from all of it would be the best, but I certainly would encourage that it not go to the circuit. From my experience, and it's been limited, uh, that most vouchers that go to the Eighth Circuit 
at least in the past, have been cut uh, without lots of, of um, feedback on why. Some of it has been that what you're supposed to do as a CJA attorney, this is supposed to be pro bono, and the fees that you earn are to help uh, pay you back, so it's not entirely free. It, it compensates you to some extent. And so it's with that eye that, that my understanding has been that the uh, when, when the vouchers have been reviewed at the Eighth Circuit, that they've been cut. And so I don't think that that is, is helpful. I think that, that certainly, as Christine said, uh, an appeal and a review process is good, but I, I would think that it would not, taking it to the circuit would not be helpful. It should be a review process down at the district court level, and then if you want to appeal what the district court said, have some kind of group or panel with expertise in criminal defense that could, re, that could give an answer that could uh, resolve that dispute. Ms. Ford? I would remove all the judges from the, from the voucher process and have someone like the, the case budgeting attorney who's knowledgeable, who can do the review, who can make the decisions. And then, yes, I think that if there, uh, there are decisions made against the attorney that there should be a process for uh, maybe the, the panel selection committee to be the the, the Court of Appeals, but that the, it seems like to me that the judges would be happy to get rid of the job and raise the caps. The caps need to be raised. How high would you raise them? Um, I'd raise them to $15,000, and I base that on a, an earlier question about what would a private attorney hire for a felon in possession case, and I had the opportunity to text my panel representative and ask him what he thought the going rate was in, in Knoxville, and he said $15,000. Let me switch just for a moment. Uh, Ms. Ford, in, in the written statements that you provided for us, one of the issues that you raised was that you felt there was a gap between the quality of representation provided by the federal public defenders and the panel attorneys. And when the surveys that we've seen of judges uh, across the country have come up with similar kinds of results, that they've said that really sort of the gold standard has been the federal defenders and that there is a significant gap between the defenders and the panel attorneys and the, even another gap between the panel attorneys and the retained attorneys. So what I'd like to do, Ms. Ford, is begin with you and ask just about how can we uh, decrease that gap? How can we make the panel attorneys more like the federal defenders because I think they are at a distinct disadvantage possibly in terms of training but certainly in terms of resources. So could you speak to that please? Well, I think the good news is that when you look at the previous surveys, the gap has gotten smaller. So there are things that are going on that are evidently making a positive impact on the, the quality provided by panel attorneys. Um, there are, there are several things that need focus. Uh, one is the, the training, uh, making training available. Uh, the defender, the uh, training division does a wonderful job. They always get great reviews. However, panel lawyers have a hard time closing up shop and traveling across the country or regionally for, for several days. So I think that the, there's a, a big responsibility on all of the, the defenders to provide good quality um, CLE. Uh, I think that another thing that would, uh, would improve the quality is to, um, to make it easier for uh, panel lawyers to engage uh, experts uh, I think I gave an example in, in my written materials about how how easy it is for someone in my office to get approval for an expert above the the twenty seven hundred dollars uh, compared to how difficult it is for a panel lawyer to get the very same uh, expert. So that would would help to level the the playing field and improve the quality of representation provided by panel lawyers. Let me ask the rest of you to comment on that, but you raised an issue too about the use of experts. Uh, from the data that we've seen, and Professor Gould has referred to this before, the use of experts 
is, is shockingly low in a number of the districts around the country. Uh, what can we do to improve that? And I'll open that up to anybody that would like to respond. I hope that all of you would like to. In, in my district, we had several years ago, we had one of the highest use of investigators in the country. And I tried to figure out why that was. And the, the only things that I can point to, um, or the biggest thing that I can point to, is that we try to be sure that the panel lawyers know how helpful it is to, to have an investigator and, and other experts, that we include that information in our training materials, our orientation uh, seminar, in our other uh, seminars through the year. So I think the, a big part of it is education. When the, when the district specific um, numbers on the use of experts and investigators was first circulated among the defender community, um, I, got, I was surprised to find out how little they were used in, in my district. And education was the answer there. We, we had some seminars, we talked about it more. Um, and I think the time was right, too. I mean, in the past in Nashville, it, would, it was real hard to find a competent investigator. There were maybe one or two uh, that were privately available. They're much more available now, which is a combination of just more people going out and opening up investigative agencies and the demand increasing because the lawyers were now asking for and being authorized to get it. And also, I, I'd like to address your earlier question just um, briefly. Um, Right now, although I think my lawyers uh, across the board are the, frankly, the best lawyers in the country, um, I think there are a substantial portion of the members of the panel in, in Nashville, I think, provide rec representation that is just as good as the lawyers in my office do. Not every one of them, but a, but a, a, a substantial majority of them do. And in some ways, they're better. They, there are some things they do better than, than, than the lawyers in my office. And I think that's uh, partly we're lucky. Uh, we have a supportive bench. But it's a combination of the selectivity of the lawyers that get on the panel, the continued monitoring of the quality of, of the lawyers. We actually now are removing lawyers who don't pr provide the quality that, that we expect. The training and relationship between uh, my office and the, and the panel members. We do week, monthly lunch and learns, monthly round tables. We have a, a listserv that the panel developed now that's busy every day that's, that's, that's uh, um, the members are limited to my staff and to members of the panel. Um, and the interaction we hit, we um, regularly take calls and visits. Uh, and so it's really like one big office to a large extent. And I really don't think there's a gap in, in quality of representation. I think it needs to be easier to get experts, including investigators. I think we saw that yesterday where the panel lawyer said, it's easier for me to check the computer records than to go bother get an expert. So one way to do, the, or even an investigator, one way is to set those numbers, $5,000 for an investigator or something where they wouldn't have to go to the court. Um, I also think we have an advantage that I'm not quite sure how you deal with, which is we are in offices of experts. If I have a question, I walk down the hall and talk to people who've had four arguments in the Supreme Court. Um, and so, and, and as you've heard, they're solo practitioners. So we need to figure out not just training, but build networks of people they can try to duplicate that ability to get advice on, on questions that, that can really help. Um, I think we close the gap between the defenders and the panel through education, as the others have said, and that's their training. And what I do in, in our district is I get some of the premier criminal defense attorneys to participate in the training of panel lawyers and my staff. Um, and so I, I think that's how we close that gap. Now, as far as experts, uh, I've not heard any panel attorney say that they were denied an expert. And they use them in my district. They ask the court for investigators and experts on cases. You know, my, you know I, I heard uh, uh, lawyers talk yesterday about, oh, this is just a gun case. Well, in my district, we handle a lot of gun cases. And I don't know of just a gun case. I have gun cases that have robbery involved. I have a gun case that involves a rape. You know, so I, there, we have to use experts. Or just a gun case where there are five or six people in a room and everybody's arrested and my client says, it wasn't my gun. So I gotta hire a fingerprint expert, a DNA expert. You know, I want DNA done on not just the gun, but the bullets. So, I mean, we use experts and our panel lawyers do too. 
I think one of the th reasons in my district that panel lawyers are reluctant to want to try to hire investigators and, and experts such as that is because they'd rather do it themselves. The majority of the panel attorneys, this is their sole source of income, is what they earn off of appointments. And so if they can do the work themselves and bill out that two, three, four hours, then they get money they otherwise would not. Uh, I've put on a number of seminars. The the uh, turnout for those seminars has been disappointing. Uh, I've sent emails to all the panel attorneys asking for what they want, the type of training they want, get very little feedback. It appears that what they're wanting to do is to try to maximize the amount of money they can earn on each case. And one of the ways they try to do that is not ask for experts, but rather do it themselves. Let me follow up with that, if I may. Do you think they're qualified to do that in all instances? For example, if they've got a big e-discovery case, uh, do they have the skills to actually do that? Or I would say they do not. They, they need to be getting experts. Uh, we have a lot of child pornography cases in our district, and rarely, I'm not sure I can even remember a time where a panel attorneys asked for a computer forensic expert to go in and look at computers and, and to answer a lot of the questions that I know the defendants have in our cases of where we do use uh, computer forensic experts. And so, no, I don't even think that unless it's just going and picking up a record that, that's close and readily available, which you wouldn't need an investigator for, that they do have the expertise to, to engage in the services that experts are needed for. All right, thank you. Okay. I just, before I uh, uh, ask the committee for generally for questions, I had a question for you, Ms. Freeman. Um, when you did your opening statement, you said something about um, being asked about the death penalty. Yes. Okay. So what, what did you want to say? Because I didn't hear anybody ask you anything about no, it. No, it hasn't been discussed. In fact, well, I thought that that was one of your focuses for, right. for this session. And it is. Session. But, but, you know, um, it kind but, of depended on... Um, areas of expertise and, and some of the information that we felt we could get. You're, you're in a CDO, correct? Correct. Do you have a CHU available to you? Well, in my testimony, I described it at length. I right. ha we have the Capital Habeas Unit, and it's a statewide unit. We do all the Capital Habeas cases in Alabama in the three federal districts. And how does that work? Well, um, we're operating in a state that has no system for state post-conviction or for direct appeal or for... Um, public defenders. Um, we have 60-some judicial districts in this state, and each judicial district chooses their own system of public defender, uh, whether it's a case-by-case -case appointment or local attorneys, or in probably over half of them, contract attorneys. Um, there are now five public defender offices in the state, um, but the absence of an institutional defender means that the quality of the trial work and the quality of the state post-conviction is nil. Um, we don't have a system for automatic appointment to state post-conviction, even in death penalty cases. And so um, the, the work of making sure that issues are adequately exhausted um, really doesn't, doesn't, isn't addressed other than through the ABA Committee, Equal Justice Initiative, and our project. And I mentioned in our testimony that we created a separate project in order to recruit and support volunteer counsel in state habeas. Um, and so what I think is that the effort to come up with a uniform system for capital habeas, and, and let me just pause for a minute and say, um, none of the problems that we've had in our state, they're just totally different from the Fifth Circuit issues and the Fifth Circuit capital habeas issues. I mean, that's uh, another universe, fortunately. Um, but we have this problem um, that I think um, the bureaucracy and the administration uh, don't recognize as existing. If an issue is not exhausted in state court, then we're a waste of time as a federal capital habeas unit. We, there's, there's no point to our even existing. Um, so I think there has to be some recognition that uh, for the federal capital habeas unit to be effective, there has to be an awareness of what the state habeas practice is in that district. We have to be allowed the flexibility to address it. We have to be allowed the flexibility to uh, work to make sure that the federal constitutional issues are adequately preserved in state court. All right, thank you. Um, anybody? Mr. Kahn. 
I'll be happy to repeat your question. <laughs> so, so what I was saying is that in reading your testimony, it appears to me that most of the horrors you describe derive from the complete and utter failure of the state system. And of course, we don't have any control over that. So I'm, what, my question to you is, what are the specific suggestions you could make that we could consider that might affect this. I'm thinking, you know, one is possibly what Sean was talking about yesterday about increased flexibility to go back into state court to exhaust matters. But are there other things we ought to be looking at and trying to address what's going on in Alabama? Well, I think that when a capital habeas unit is placed in a jurisdiction that has no system for state habeas, we should be allowed to create a system for state habeas, at least for our clients, which is what we've tried to do through the nonprofit that we created. I think that um, the, it, it's just been very clear to me that, that the Defender Services Organization just doesn't seem aware of um, what this question about being in state court means in a jurisdiction like ours. I mean, we have to have the flexibility to create um, some structure and to work with that structure. I don't mind it being um, measured and observed and having to report on that structure, but um, uh, otherwise we're, we're just, we, are, we can't accomplish anything for our clients. Um, the, the, the cases that I mentioned where procedurally they were dropped got no relief in federal court. So it, it's unimaginable to me, I mean, even as I, as I spin whatever dreams I have of what we might be able to accomplish, that Congress would fund a system that would, uh, that would litigate fully in state court capital habeas cases. And so can you try and be a little bit more specific about practical solutions we can adopt? And can you also address how Martinez affects this analysis, because it seems to me like that has opened a door to allow you to go after the, the failure. Yes, but you're aware that the 11th Circuit has a very restrictive view of Martinez. And the, I, I don't practice in the 11th oh. anymore, so I don't really know. You know everything, Ruben. So <laughs> at, in any event, the, the 11th Circuit has a uh, very narrow take on the application of Martinez. So it's opened a little tiny door, but it's just a crack. Um, I think that there should be, um, there should be some requirement that we're reporting on how uh, we are effective in what we're doing. Um, I think that just as, um, it may be inconceivable to you, but I, I think that that has to be done. I just think it has to be done. You can't, you can't continue to pretend that we are addressing these problems when we're the icing on the surface of you know, a garbage dump. I mean, that is just not appropriate. Um, and so I think that um, allowing us the flexibility to go into state court, I mean, maybe we'd have to justify it to some, to some extent or to some other way, but um, we have to be able to preserve federal constitutional issues, and they're not being preserved if, with the absence of any system. Um, it might be that we would have to, um, that the, the CJA could be amended to say that if there is, uh, if, if there is a state where uh, certain requirements are met, then um, the federal defender will not be permitted to go into state court. But where those requirements are not met, we ought to be permitted to do that. Could I add something that, I mean, in fact, for eight years, the federal judiciary did fund uh, litigation um, centers that worked in both state and federal courts. Now, there was a requirement, and that's the death penalty, re death penalty resource centers, there was a requirement of some degree of state um, participation in the funding, uh, but in a number of states, and maybe even including Alabama, Alabama that, that participation was the contributed time of the staff um, of, the, uh, of the resource center. 
So they were essentially worked for half the pay of, uh, of fully funded uh, centers. And they were closed ultimately by Congress and by, by, several, uh, by several states. Also, I think, and this is, extends maybe a little bit beyond your direct um, uh, 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 charter, but the, 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 the kind of litigation that Christine is talking about is, it has significantly become more complex than it was 20 or 30 years ago, even at the time of the resource centers. Um, and the federal government that seems to have no trouble at all funding uh, local and state law enforcement um, and, and prosecutorial offices through grants out of the Department of, of Justice. And the need for the federal government to recognize that the states are, are unable or unwilling to fund the defense side, and particularly in things like capital litigation and, and capital litigation that does ultimately lead to the, to the habeas litigation, a recommendation that, that Congress, either through the Department of Justice or otherwise, um, make more money available to state uh, programs. That were, it's not just going back into the state post-conviction. If you can't address things at the trial level, you can continue to have poorly litigated cases coming through the system and with people being executed because of the resources weren't provided at the state trial level. You know, there are millions of dollars that come to Alabama's um, law enforcement agencies from the federal government. Um, and I, I, I don't know of the pittance that comes other than to our federal defender offices that comes to the defense function. So why isn't there some requirement that if federal dollars are going to the law enforcement agencies, there should be uh, comparable requirements for the defense function or there should be some, um, some measurement of, of process um, required to be shown in the state system? I mean, federal dollars built some of our state prisons. Did you have one, Judge, Judge Prado? We have one. Well, well, we have others, but go ahead, Judge Prado. Um, let me just congratulate Henry and all his 30 years of, of service as a public defender. Uh, he's been a leader in the, in the organization. Uh, and thank you for your service to the Sixth Amendment and the Defender Program. You and I go back a long way, and there's the issue of whether the courts interfere too much or whether we need the courts to, to support us and, and be under the umbrella of the courts, and there's always these problems. And the, the committee that I was on many years ago recommended that we do this every seven years, and it did not happen. And I think one of the reasons we are having this now is because of sequestration and and the perception I say perception that that defender services and public defenders and the whole program was treated unfairly by the courts when the budget crisis hit now the whole court was cut across the board everybody even us judges maybe not as much but us judges everybody had to bear the the, the hurt of a budget uh, situation. And maybe, Henry, you have a better pulse of the national level since, since you've been around for so long and, and, and uh, are familiar, more familiar with it, but all of you, is it, was it a real unfairness on the part of the courts the way Defender service was, Services was treated budget-wise is it a perception? Uh, many of you are out in your districts doing work and don't know the heart of what's going on in, in D.C. So when this sequestration issue came up and everybody had to be cut off, uh, uh, many of you saw it as the defender surfaces treated harder and harsher than other, other parts of the courts. And maybe that should not be the case because defender services and your responsibility defending people is different from probation or the clerk's office. And maybe that, that, that enough is reason why you should not have been treated like everybody else. But was there an unfairness and were the, was the program treated harsher than, than other parts of the court? Yes. Okay, next question, no. I, I, <laughs> Uh, until about three years ago, I, I had uh, uh, every confidence that the position that the majority of the defenders took uh, during your uh, committee's uh, work was still the correct position. And I, th and I think looking back even now that it was a correct position a at the time. But the, I, I think we have been so um, 
mistreated by the budget and executive committees of the Judicial Conference in the last three years, um, that I'm not the only one that's um, reassessing that. And, and I think the, uh, we're nowhere near unanimity now on, on, on uh, I think, um, where we think this committee should go in, in, on, in, on independence. Um, but there is a lot more um, frustration and, and feeling of mistreatment and abandonment among defenders um, by the way the judiciary at the very top um, has handled the CJA appropriation and these programs um, that we are troubled um, and are looking seriously at alternatives. Um, the alternatives are not necessarily real appealing um, either, but but uh, there is a real sense that we've been mistreated and, and that, the, that the leadership of the judiciary no longer feels, um, as it's currently constituted, no longer feels that this is a special program, that this is a special trust that they've been vested with. There are a lot of, a lot of individual judges that feel that way, but they're currently not in leadership positions. Mr. Martin, can I make a follow-up question to that? Because one thing we hear is, you weren't the only ones that were caught. Um, magistrates no longer have an office. Um, you know, and, and certainly I would think that they would feel mistreated um, and, and betrayed by their judges. So why is it different? I mean, why are you more victimized than anyone else in the judiciary? I don't know of any other um, agency within the judiciary or outside the judiciary that suffered the, the number of personnel losses that we did uh, at the time. Um, and my office was, was lucky that we, I, we didn't have to lay anybody off, but for 17 weeks, we were paid four days a week um, and still working you know, throughout that period of time. Um, and to my knowledge, nobody in the probation office um, was either working for free or going home uh, and losing the income, and nobody in chambers, nobody in the clerk's office. Um, and, and, I, I, and that could have been avoided. There was, there was money um, where, where that could have been avoided. Um, and, and, I, and, and so that's why we felt like we were left unprotected. Do you know if the CJA attorneys were ever reimbursed for the amounts that were cut? Uh, they, I don't believe they were. Now, they were also mistreated. That also could have been avoided. And, and, but but their, their amounts were cut, and to your knowledge, they were not reimbursed? Not, not for the work, that they, for the vouchers that they submitted during that period of time. I mean, there, there were some maybe that were paid late, but I don't think they were paid during the time for the, the reduction in the rate. I don't think it, when that was restored, it was not made retroactive. Thank you. And if I can just echo that, <coughs> the way we were cut um, and the fact that the executive committee and the budget committee ignored the recommendation of Defender Services, which was to defer panel payments and not to take it all out of the defenders, was the judiciary, at least the top, and not those of you sitting at the table, um, completely ignoring how we should be treated. And I think there was also, it, came, it brought to the fore statements by the leadership of the judiciary, even to Congress, that we were a spendthrift program and that a dollar for us was a dollar less for the judiciary which made us realize even more, even though we're not supposed to, that we were competing for the same funds. And as any human being in that position would be, even judges, if there's um, a limited pot, they're gonna seek the funds for themselves. Um, I, the whole work measurement was part of the judiciary's belief that we were a spendthrift organization. And I was gonna go from there that and then work measurement followed, and work measurement showed that we were very hardworking, understaffed organizations. I was going to say, and I, when I took over this job, it was in the midst of taking eight furlough days, and we lost seven staff members. Um, and but it hasn't stopped because with the work measurement, we I was given a budget shared it with my staff, we were very happy. Now the AO knows that we really worked and I looked into the computer system and a million and some dollars of my money was gone. So I start calling up people. I talked to Mr. Martin, I said, something's going on. <laughs> you know, there's an online monster eating up my budget. Something is going on, the money is gone. They took back over a million dollars after giving me a budget to support my staff. Just so I'm, I'm clear, or it's clear, the, the money for defender services or, or for public defender is, is, is separate and apart from the main budget. So it's not like there was intermingled money and money was taken away from defender budgets to 
hire probation officers or anything of that type. I mean, which money was still kept separate. And, and just to give another example of the insult of sequestration and work measurement, we were told that everyone else had to do work measurement, probation officers, court, court people, and so we were just like everybody else, and we're not. When they tried to do work measurement on the U.S. attorneys, they couldn't do it. And to be compared to court reporters and probation officers and to assume that our tasks can fit into widgets was um, devastating to morale. And, and where did the idea concept come from the, to do the survey? I mean, was it for, out of defender services or somewhere else in the courts that they decided this needed to be done? Well, do we know? Your, your original report talked about how non-transparent the judiciary is, but I think it was the executive committee and the budget okay. committee. Well, and, and the so. judicial resources committee, yeah. which was given jurisdiction over our staffing um, size and, 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 and budgets. And can I say one thing about work measurement formula? It is so inflexible. It does not recognize that we have to react to what other people do in the system. Uh, drugs minus two. We have 1,400 cases in our office to review, and most of those will get motions filed. Johnson, we have 1,700 cases to review, and probably about 10% of those we will need to file, or we want to file, a 2255. But we're looking at this five-year uh, average that I can't go out and hire people and, and Defender Services can't give me people to deal with those cases. We'll get it done, but we'll be working very long hours. Dr. Gould. Thank you, Judge Cardone. So Dr. Rucker was mentioning uh, this issue of the differential use of uh, experts by panel attorneys across the country. And I've actually been chronicling the answers we've been getting from the various witnesses um, who've testified. And I'm gonna throw out what I have for you right now, and I'd like to see if there are any other explanations that we haven't heard from that when you think about this, like, oh yeah, the committee needs to know that this is another possibility. So I would put these in three broad categories. One is there's something about the case. So things the committee has heard from witnesses would be, Either the, the facts of the case don't really lend themselves to an expert, or we had um, one witness say that the discovery this person gets from the U.S. attorney is so sufficient that it's really not necessary to hire an expert. So one category would be the case. <clears throat> the other would be, category would be the lawyer. Either the lawyer is not trained enough to recognize that uh, an expert's needed or just doesn't know. Uh, we've heard that a number of lawyers like to do the investigation themselves, and Mr. Eddy, you added a uh, corollary to that this morning, which is that there's a financial incentive to do it themselves and not bring in someone else. And then we also have the category of the judge slash the process. So the committee has heard either that judges aren't granting requests to have experts, the ex parte process is too daunting, lawyers don't want to have to go through it, the rates are too low or it takes too long for the expert to get paid, so it's difficult to find experts, that lawyers are worried that if they ask for experts, they'll be seen as, quote, the expensive lawyer and they will risk getting future appointments. Or finally, that there is something about the culture of criminal practice in that district, across the entire district, that simply has all lawyers, except maybe you as the public defenders, simply not litigating at a certain level. Anything else that the committee should hear as a possible explanation that isn't on that list? Experts may not be available. I, I think Judge Cardone referenced that in Portland, um, depending on where you are. Um, for example, in Del Rio, whether you can get right. certain kinds of experts. Okay, anything else? All right, then follow-up question. Uh, the districts you all represent also represent one of the very highest rate of expert use in the country and also either the lowest or almost the lowest rate 
of expert use. And um, uh, with all due respect, Ms. Randall Holt, the, actually, the panel lawyers in your district are near the bottom. They aren't using experts that often. So I'm wondering of the reasons that I've listed that you all say there really isn't more to add to that, can you identify the top explanations for the use or non-use of experts, mainly non-use of experts in your district? I know it's tempting to say, although they all apply, but certainly certain ones apply more in certain districts than in others. As you think about the panel of lawyers in your districts, to the extent that they are not using experts, what are the primary reasons? You'll be hearing from our panel representative later today, so he may have a different perspective on this. Well, absolutely, but well, because you but get to sit back from it all and look at them, you, you also have a very important perspective. I think that um, at least in our district, in the Middle District of Alabama, um, our panel lawyers, all none of them are um, full-time panel attorneys, so this isn't their only source of income. Many of them have a state criminal defense practice as well. The, the use of experts in state criminal practice is abysmal in our district um, and virtually non-existent. And for example, um, one defense attorney had to litigate getting the copy of his client's videotape confession uh, for free in advance uh, or would he be required to pay for it in order to get it up front before he could be reimbursed by it for any cost? I mean, there's just a mindset that is mind-boggling. Um, I do think that we've done some education with our panel attorneys. I also think that we have an obligation to be reviewing the quality of the work our panel attorneys do and that their use of experts ought to be part of that. Um, I think we've kind of done that in the past in our district. We're definitely doing it more intensively now that we have term limits. Um, and I think that the mindset that the, the CJA panel should be the best of the best, should be basically an expert panel of, of private counsel, will help in the use of experts. Mr. Eddy, other things besides that it's not in their interest, uh, financial interest to hire experts? I think it's also that they've not used experts in the past. They don't know how to work with one. They don't know what type of information to give them. They don't know the advantages that an expert can bring to your case, whether you're going to trial or whether it's mitigation for a sentencing expert. They just don't know how to take the information that an expert can bring them and then what to do with it. So I think there's a lot of that. They're just uncomfortable. They've never used them, don't know how to use them. Mr. Martin, I'm going to skip you because you actually have a high rate of expert use, but we'll come back to you. <laughs> so, I was going to tell you how I think it got there. Oh, okay. There are two things that just occurred to me as we were talking to, uh, of part of the education process. One is in the interviews we do with applicants, we now go over with them what your experience is using experts, and, and generally that will lead into a discussion about, well, you're in a different world now because they do come like Christine's from state practice. Uh, and the other thing is the listserv that I mentioned regularly will have somebody saying, I've got this issue, I need an expert, who's you so-and-so, or you know, what do, I, what do I do? And just the, that, that interaction has raised everybody's level of, of awareness of the need. Uh, Ms. Ford, I'm sorry, I, we, we skipped you. Is there anything, what, what's the story in your district? Well, I'm looking at the, the summary of vouchers that were paid in 2015 for experts in our district and it looks like that we did fairly well in every category except psychiatrists and that could be that that's just not a, a expertise that people look for they rely mostly on psychologists so I would like to think that we're at least above average you are okay good um, and I it's I, like I well begone and, <laughs> <laughs> yes. and uh, I think that it's because of the education and the kinds of speakers we've had at our seminars we brought in psychologists and we bring in psychiatrists and computer experts. And Ms. Myers, you mentioned the fiscal difficulty of locating an expert. Is there more in your district? I think most of it is, uh, I think most of it's culture. I think most people are solo practitioners come out of state court where they just don't use experts much. Um, I do think, I think all cases can benefit from experts. A significant, um, portion of our docket is undocumented, is illegal reentry, And often 
Uh, the two issues in this case are the prior convictions, which if you can get it on a computer, you don't need an investigator. The other, of course, would be mitigation. A lot of that mitigation is not in the United States, so I think people just rely on the letters from the kids saying, bring my daddy home. Hmm. Okay. And, and finally, anything that you'd like to add? I'm, I'm really shocked because maybe it's because the lawyers are doing some of the, like picking up the records themselves since between federal court and, the, and where the records are kept in state court for prior convictions is just right across the street. It's, not, it's a short distance. But as far as other expert services, um, you know, I, I know that some of them use them. When I was in the courtroom, I don't know what years we're looking at. Uh, the last the, three fiscal years. But that's what I was going to say. I haven't been in the court that much in the last three years. But uh, prior to that, they were using a lot of it. You know, even co-defendant cases. Uh, and in the last three years, they shouldn't have gotten a lot of cases because after sequestration, that's one thing about my court, they made sure that my office got our 75% of the cases. So our panel got a low number of cases. So I'm going to say it's probably the facts of the cases that they got. We got the most difficult cases. They may not have needed an expert. Okay. Uh, that, thank you. <laughs> Judge Cardone, that's all for me. All right, then we're going to go ahead and take a break, a short break. Um, it is about 1140 now. Um, let's take a 10 minute break so we don't want too far behind. We're going to resume at 1150 um, for, with panel seven. Thank you for coming. 